shape me, help make me more than what I am. Reaching the lost. I'm just here to tell you that God's in the process right now of establishing some bridges. Teaching the found. We've got to be able to get a generation from one side over into the next. With passion. There is power. Power. Power here today. And purpose. I just had to make up my mind a long time ago that I'm going to do this come hell or high water. Power for living with Bishop Dale C. Bronner. Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. Matthew, Mark. You're already there. The ninth chapter, beginning with verse 14. Notice here the word of the Lord. And when he came to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around them and scribes disputing with them. Immediately when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed and running to him greeted him. And he asked the scribes, what are you discussing with them? And then one of the crowd answered and said, teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit and Wherever it seizes him, it throws him down, he foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. And so I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. And he answered him and said, O oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. And then they brought him to him. And when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. And so he asked the father, how long has he, this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. And immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter no more. And then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and came out of him. And he became as one dead, so that many said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had come into the house, his disciples ask him privately why could we not cast it out and so he said to them this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting i'm speaking today simply from the subject this kind this kind he was a man that was desperately concerned about his son and, and he desperately wanted help for him you know that it had to be desperate if the daddy had to bring him to jesus now, it's one thing when mama brings him to Jesus, but it's another thing when daddy has to step in to bring him to Jesus. It is really a dire situation. It's very, very serious. But this man was, uh, this, this man's son was perhaps mentally deranged in some way. Uh, some of the Bible theologians believe that perhaps he was an epileptic and he had seizures and he would cause him to fall down and foam at the mouth and do all of these things. But this was something that frustrated this man, and so he was doing everything within his power to try to get help for his son because he knew that this was beyond his own strength and realm of knowledge. And uh, I realized today that there are so many parents who are dealing with situations where they feel like this is demonic and something satanic that is happening and is beyond my level of knowledge or faith. Uh, it's interesting that uh, when Jesus said that all things are possible to him that believe, the Father said, I believe, but help my unbelief. Uh, in other words, I, I'm sure that you understand how you can sympathize with this man because he was saying, I do believe, but help my unbelief. Have you ever been in a position where you were standing in faith for something, but you got some little doubt that's creeping and tapping on the, on the head saying, you know, it's been a long time now. I know what the Lord said and what you're believing for, but you know, has it, has it ever occurred to you that maybe it's not going to happen? And you got something just, just tapping on you, just saying, hey, 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 maybe it's not going to happen for you. And you, you, you're saying, I do have faith, I believe, but help my unbelief. Now, now here's the deal you can still get God to work for you with faith in your heart and doubt in your head 
Your head, in fact, will always doubt what God has spoken in your heart. So don't be alarmed by that. When you got a little voice that's speaking on the inside of you trying to doubt what God, as long as you have faith in your heart, who believes that those things that he saith shall come to pass in his heart, well, you believe that in your heart. It's all right to have doubt in your head as long as faith is in your heart. You can still get God to work with you. So don't let a little doubt discount or nullify all of your faith. Faith works in the heart. Doubt works in the head. So don't doubt it in your heart, and you'll be all right with God. So this man was just being honest. He's saying, I believe, but help my unbelief. If you really were honest with yourself almost every time that you believe God for something that seemed difficult or impossible to you, there was something in the back of your mind that's saying, what if you don't get it? Suppose she leave you anyway. Suppose he leave you anyway. But you've got to push beyond that doubt and let your faith work for you anyhow. But here was a father that was dealing uh, with, a, with a spirit in his child. And it's interesting to note that Jesus rebuked a deaf and a dumb spirit. He rebuked both, both of those. And, and this, this blocked the child from being able to hear or to speak, to communicate. And, and here's the deal, that whenever our children, whenever our children have a problem in their own life of being deaf and dumb, deaf and mute, Here's, here's what it says to us, because understand that this story is told in all three of the synoptic gospels. It's told in Matthew, the same story is told in Mark, the same story is told in Luke, in all three of the synoptic gospels. If you find a story in all three of the synoptic gospels, it is significant. And this is not just about one person's peculiar situation with their child. May I just tell you that I believe that this is emblematic of a generation that is on the scene today. It is emblematic of a generation that's on the scene today. And I'm not talking about uh, what people do to their external. Uh, you know, if, if the little external stuff that our children were doing nowadays was all that they were doing, I would I tell you don't even be concerned about it. Don't, don't get concerned with body piercing and uh, mohawks and because uh, and, and they're tatted up. Don't, don't even let that bother you. That, that's, that, that's not even an issue. What bothers us is when something on the inside of them starts causing them to do stuff that is out of character and away from the home training that we've tried to put in them. Then that's when you've got a problem and they become deaf and mute where they don't listen to you and they don't talk to you. They don't communicate with you. So we've got a generation that is on the scene now that don't listen to their parents and they don't communicate with them. And whenever a generation stops listening and stops talking to their parents, something demonic and satanic takes over them and their behavior becomes bizarre. And it'll cause them to throw themselves down on the ground, wallowing in stuff, foaming at the mouth, saying stuff that has no substance to it and that makes no sense because it is not grounded in reason nor in wisdom. That's foam, foam, just a whole lot of fluff. You don't have any substance, just foam, and they're saying stuff, but it doesn't amount to a hill of beans because they don't even know what they are talking about. And they are deaf. They can't even hear the wisdom of a parent who's trying to tell them, baby, I've already been there. I've already messed up. Listen, let me tell you about your granddad and your grandma. I know what you're dealing with. I know the temptations that are coming to you. I know the weaknesses of your flesh. Did you know that a generational curse does not mean that a person is predisposed to doing something? It means that there is a weakness to that thing. A curse is a weakness. It is a weakness. It doesn't absolutely mean that they will do it. It means, though, that they will have a weakness to this. If there's a curse of cancer in a family, it means that there's a weakness to the condition of cancer developing in that body. It doesn't mean that it will develop, but there is a, you have more of a, of a natural proclivity for it to happen. There's a weakness to it. 
So the environment is very volatile. And so here this man was raising his son, and his son uh, wasn't listening to him, and he wasn't talking to him. And whenever they become disconnected, where they can't hear us and we can't understand them, then you have something that is lunacy, something that is demonic and satanic that takes over that generation. And Jesus points out, he says, this kind, this kind, this kind, you know the kind that I'm talking about. This is the kind where you have folks that do stuff that you just can't understand. And this is not just relegated just to children. Some people have parents that are like this. Some folks have siblings that are like this. Some folks got a boss like that. Some folks got employees like this. Some folks have neighbors that are like this. This kind comes out. You've seen the people pushing the, the empty uh, shopping cart around with a hot coat on in the summertime. You, you, you've seen that. This kind. When it says this kind, it means this kind is something that is not solved through intellectualism. Secular humanism won't fix this. You will not get this fixed in a counseling office. You can't take a bipolar child and they just sit them down and say, young man, young lady, how are you doing this morning? And you can't counsel out something that is a legitimate mental illness. And medication does not fix all of them. It might subdue it, but let them get off of it for a few days. Somebody knows what I'm talking about because you got somebody in your family. You got a friend. You know somebody who's a little special this kind. You, you know the man's son, you, they, they are in our communities. If you ride martyr, you know what I'm talking about. You bump into them in public places from time to time. You, you, you know they are a friend of a friend. They are somebody in your family, and, and they scare you. This kind uh, does not come out by reasoning. It does not come out through argument. It is not solved through counseling, and you cannot medicate it out. This kind. This kind, this, this kind comes out by prayer and by fasting. There are some things that are happening in our culture today, that are in our society today, that I don't care how sophisticated your counseling degrees are. When a mind is twisted, everything that goes in it gets twisted. And you cannot solve it through counseling. Have anybody know about this kind? Uh, I mean, when you, you, you've seen a person that has a sickness, they've already done this before, they know what drugs will do to you, and yet they keep going back to it. I mean, they know how terrible prison is, and yet the recidivism rate is so high, there is a lunacy there, that, that that's a craziness once you've been to jail one time to go back again, and you done told them, boy, listen, if you get in trouble again, don't call me. You know why parents cut off from their children and families get tired of them? It's because that was not the first offense. They've dealt with that one time and another time and another time. They have told them, and it didn't fix it. Because this kind does not go by sitting down and breathing out threats. I'm talking about this kind, where you got somebody and the issue is that they are bipolar. You don't fix that by sitting down and saying, I mean it. I mean it. I'm going to cut off the money. Listen, you can cut the money off. You can take away their clothes. It will not fix that problem of this kind. You, anybody now, do you understand a little better now what I'm talking about this kind? This kind is a dangerous situation. We've got a whole generation that is on the scene now that is this kind. It's, it is this kind. And, and what, whenever our children stop, stop listening, whenever they become deaf to us, whenever they become mute, they stop talking to us. Something demonic, satanic takes over them and they begin to do bizarre things. And so Jesus asked the person here how long this boy had been suffering with this condition. And the man said, since childhood from a child because when you find messed up adults nine times out of ten the issue started in childhood you go you trace it back to the home you trace it back to something in childhood where it started off with that doing a little crazy thing and it started off cute and that's something that looked cute when you fall out on the floor at two years old but when you get to be 17 <laughs> it ain't cute anymore and, and, and when a little child, I put their hands on the hip and, and they, ah, you, you shut up. And you can get in laughing then, but when they get to be 12 and they got their hand on their hip and tell you to shut up, that is not cute. This kind. Listen, listen. If you don't nip certain things in the bud, 
when they're down here. When it grows up here, see, you can take a little tree that's growing wild in your yard and almost yank it up with your own bare hands and pull it out of the root, but let it grow up and get some, some, some real diameter to it. You're going to have to get a chainsaw. <laughs> this kind. This kind. Say this kind. This kind. This kind. This kind. And so we, we, we want to be able to deal with, with this kind, and this is what, what Jesus is dealing with. It is interesting that whenever you see external behavior, uh, external behavior generally comes out of some kind of a motivation, that there's a motive or reason for it. It's interesting, Webster defines motive as that within the individual rather than outside of the individual, which causes him or her to act. That within the individual, instead of that that is outside of the individual that causes him or her to act. There's a motive behind every action. And what causes frustration to us is when we don't understand the motive. Why did they do this? Have you ever explained to a person, you know I don't like this, and then you see them do it anyway, and it frustrates you because you know that you told them, I don't like this, and they do it anyway? And you ask them not to do this again, and then they do it again, and you get frustrated because you know what the issue is not that they don't know. But we get frustrated. Why do you keep on doing this to me? And the thing that frustrates us is because we expect them to do better because we have instructed them better. But when you're dealing with this kind, see, if you knew that they were bipolar, maybe it wouldn't frustrate you because now you understand the condition behind it. And it's like they can't help it. So I don't get frustrated if I know they can't help it. But if I believe you can help it and you're doing something, I get frustrated on the inside because you're doing this. But this kind, this kind. See, when you find that something on the inside of the person that causes him or her to act, it, it means that all of our actions have motives or reasons. And they come from deeply felt needs on the inside, and no one else can feel them for us. And see, what happens to a lot of them, the devil approaches us, most of his approaches come in four different directions. Number one, delays. Delays. They're waiting on the husband. They're waiting on the wife. They're waiting on this job. They're waiting on the house. They're waiting on the car. See, that's why they miss it. He never told us to wait on things. He told us to wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord and be of good courage, and he will strengthen your heart. They that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Are you listening? Always wait on the Lord. You will get exasperated waiting on the person to change waiting on the job to come, waiting on the money to come, waiting on the loan to be approved. When you wait on the thing instead of waiting on the king, you get frustrated. They that wait, and the devil frustrates so many people because they have to wait because they're getting a older and their body clock is ticking and they haven't had the baby yet. And they're getting into an age and they're wondering, is anybody going to want to marry me at this age? And they are delayed and they're wondering. May I just remind you that all things are possible to him that believes. Don't let a delay get you frustrated. Because sometimes what you think is a devilish disappointment is nothing but a divine delay. God has a, a reason sometimes for, for delaying it, and because we don't understand the delay, we become frustrated at what we don't understand. The second thing that the devil uses is deception. Deception. He'll use a delay, then he'll use a deception. He'll use somebody to make you think this is the one. Oh, you think you've been, you know, you've waited all this time, and I, you finally think this is the one. And you get deceived. They have painted the picture that they all this in a bag of chips. And then when you open the bag, you realize how much air is in it? You thought you were getting something full, and about a third of the bag is in there, and two-thirds of the stuff is air. And you are frustrated over the deception of something that looked like it had a full deck. And so many cards were missing that you couldn't play talk. 
You couldn't play 21. <laughs> Deception. And we get frustrated because we get deceived. There are delays. If he doesn't get you by delay, he'll try to come by deception. If he doesn't get you by deception, he will get you by distraction. Psst. Hey, let me holler at you, shorty. <laughs> You'll be on your purpose, on your mission, trying to handle your business, trying to turn your dream into a reality, and somebody will distract you with another opportunity offering you something that is good, that is the enemy of something that is best for you, and you get distracted, sidetracked, and you lose the, 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 the bush thing that's in the bush because you've gone after two things over here in another bush. And you lose the bone in your mouth going after two in the bush. Lost your focus because you got distracted. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You recognize any of these tactics that the devil has tried to use on you because he's delayed something and got you frustrated and mad with God or because somebody got deceived because they thought this is the one and then they get with the joker and get beat up and, and, and then he done got all that money and done had them to sign for something on that credit and then, then you find out how many other folks he done been with and he told you that this was his second marriage and you find out that it's his fourth. Deception, deception. Distraction, distraction. He'll get you through distraction. Just psst. You minding your own business and he gets you distracted. Here you are praying every day and then somebody invites you. You're trying to fast and somebody doesn't bake you a cake. Somebody give you a fish sandwich or chicken sandwich. And I mean, at any other time during the week, but it's when you take the time to fast, somebody's trying to distract you from what God is leading you to do. If he doesn't get you through delays, he'll come through deception. If he doesn't get you through deception, he'll come through distraction. If he doesn't get you through distraction, he'll come forthly through disappointment. And he'll try to disappoint your life. He'll just bring so much disappointment where, where you were expecting this and expecting that, and it just didn't pan out. You were hoping that this is going to be the one, that I'm going to close this cell, I'm going to close this thing, and then at the last minute it falls through the crack and just disappointed. You can get so disappointed with things that you thought that were promising to you that you knew you'd already banked on it. I, I had one of my brothers, we thought some money was coming in from a particular sale of a particular piece of a property. My brother had already gone out and spent his money before, we, you know, before the deal was closed. He just already obligated himself. Just, he'd already spent the money before the money came in. And it was disappointing because the deal was off. It's, it's bad when you had so much faith and confidence that this is going through that you spend the money in advance. Because you know by the time I get my bill, this money and the check will have come in. And then you find out that you were dealing with a deceiver who didn't have an ability to close the sale. And you can get awfully disappointed. You'd be surprised. Disappointment is perhaps the greatest tool that the devil uses to distract his people. Disappointment. I cannot tell you how many people have walked away from God because they got disappointed over something that they expected God to do for them. They expected, they expected God and they used the, the disappointment. He uses delays, he uses deception, he uses distraction, he uses disappointment. Did you know that one psychologist mentioned that by the time a person is eight, 18 years old, that they have been put down over a hundred thousand times. No wonder something is wrong with the generation. Can you imagine that every time, and you don't even understand what a put down is, sometimes when a child comes and pulls on your leg and they're trying to get your attention just because they want some affection from you, and, and you're reading the paper and you say, get out, get away, from, get away from here. That's a put down to that child because the message that has been sent to the child is that the newspaper is more important than I am. That they're reading their mail is more important than I am. That they're watching their favorite program on television is more important than I am. It's a put down. Can you imagine after being put down over a hundred thousand times by the time you're 18 years old, how that would make a child feel? And you wonder why they do stuff like I don't care because you didn't care when I was trying to get your attention. And then they do something bizarre because they'll say they didn't get me their attention then, but I bet I'll get it now when I've got to call them from the hospital or from the jailhouse, I will get it now when they have done something that is lunacy, when they have done something that is crazy, they'll get it now. It's amazing. Can you imagine? How do we expect people to do positive things when they've been put down over 100,000 times by the time they are 18 years old? It is insanity. But here's the thing is that he took him to the disciples 
This man, this father had taken his children to the disciples. You know there's some things that disciples just cannot fix. There's something that disciples can't fix. And sometimes people will bring them to righteous people, praying folks. They'll say, you know what, if I can get them to bishop, I, I know my child will be straightened out. Listen, bishop is not Jesus. I am not twisted about that. I am not Jesus. I am not confused in my role. I work for him. I do. I, I work for him. I, I'm not Jesus. There are certain things that I think that he designed. He built failure in the system so your faith would not be in his disciples. She had to bring them to Jesus. And every now and then, you'll be, you'll be trying to run to the church trying to get a little help, but you've got to turn your face toward heaven. I mean, when you get it real serious, you're going to have to go to Jesus for yourself. You're going to have to say, Jesus, keep me near the cross. You have to say, Father, I stretch my hands to thee. No other help I know. If thou withdraw thyself from me, God, where else can I go? Oh, the consecrated cross I bear till death shall set me free. Yes, there is a cross for everyone, and there is a cross for me. There's sometimes you got to go to Jesus for yourself. He didn't mean for the disciples to be able to work everything out. Sometimes you got to turn your plate down. That's why he said this kind. You won't be able to get in a prayer line and get this one delivered. You're going to have to pray through this one yourself. You're going to have to turn your plate down yourself. When you really got a serious problem, you need the man himself. There are some things that are accomplished through human effort. And then there are other things that are demonic in nature. If it is demonic, if it is satanic, counseling won't fix it. Drugs will not fix it. Relaxation therapy and exercise, that won't fix it. Thank you for watching Power for Living with Bishop Dale C. Bronner. Until next time.